He had a little cartoon in the bulletin today of uh, Goliath lying on the ground minus a head. You know what that's talking about? You know, in the Latin, the head is called the caput, capitus. That's what we get the word cap from, right? To take the cap off. Because it means head. Captain in the army or in the other forces means that he's the head of a particular company, right? Yeah. Cap capitus, the head. And when Goliath, Goliath, and the word Goliath actually means the one who takes away your covering. That's what it means. And when that headship is removed, he can no longer take away your covering. Your covering remains. And if you're born again, that covering is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, I'm going to talk about smooth stones today because it was one smooth stone that brought that guy down and removed the headship of the devil of everybody who was born again. Amen? He can bluff you. You know, you can think that he's still got some control, but he really doesn't. And when you start to think maybe he's got some control, stop and say, wait a minute. He's lost his head. Simple. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Zechariah 4, verses 6 to 9. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the temple. His hands shall also finish it then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Kind of find it interesting that the word Zerubbabel actually means descended from confusion. And you know, we're all descended from confusion. Every one of us. As a matter of fact, uh, Abraham's considered to be the father of faith and Abraham was a Babylonian. And Babylon actually means confusion. You know, that's why we babble on, right? <laughs> we are all born rebellious and do not change until we respond to God's calling. He's calling from the time you were conceived. It's that spirit hovering over the deep. He's calling, calling. And then one day, fortunately one day, sometimes it takes a long time, doesn't it? To say, here I am, Lord. <laughs> here I am. And then he says, you know, I've been waiting for this. Let there be light. Right? Let there be light. And that's when the light of the knowledge of God floods your soul. And it's something he does which Pastor Jim was talking about a little earlier here. It's not something we do. It's something he does. Our job is simply to say, yes, Lord. That's all it takes. Yes, Lord. And mean it. And mean it. If you don't mean it, the Word of God says, be not deceived. God will not be what? He will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. It is God's grace that gives us his word and it's up to us to hear that word. The scriptures contain many illustrations of the truth laid out in the passages that I read about Zerubbabel. The examples move from the parting of the Red Sea through the battle of Jehoshaphat to the Lord's calming of the storm on the Sea of Galilee. So we're going to begin with David's encounter with the Philistine giant, Goliath. 
that whole encounter and its significance for you and me is in another message that I call The Promise, which you will have heard before, and some of you have never heard, and some of you who have heard it before will probably hear it again, but it's never quite the same. Amen? Today, I just want to look at what it was that brought Goliath down. 1 Samuel 17, verse 40, David took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones. He took them from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now it's interesting, you know, you hear me say this all the time, if you read the Bible as most people read it, you get a lot of understanding about God's character and his plan of salvation. But if you want to really glorify God and look deeper and deeper and see what it is that he has for you and me that's word upon word, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, that it's wheels within wheels, it's dots that are connected that, that draw a picture of Christ from cover to cover. Now you look at these words. He chose for himself five smooth stones. Smooth. Smooth is from shalak in the Hebrew, and it means to separate oneself. To separate oneself. The stones. Stone is from ibn. Or ebon, depends on what you want to, how you want to pronounce it. And it means to build. To build. The stones are used in building, aren't they? And then we've got, he took them from the brook. The brook, it's a, you know, it's a body of water, a stream flowing, but it's from nakel, which means to inherit, to inherit. And put them in a shepherd's bag. A shepherd's bag. This is talking about kelai, a vessel, a vessel. Now, I don't know if you're getting anything here yet, but you know, we've got to separate self, to build from an inheritance in this vessel. Now, you know, I know people are going to say, well, that's a coincidence. Or, oh, you're just, uh, you're eisegesis. You're just reading something into it that doesn't exist. Well, uh, I'm sorry, it fits the narrative. <laughs> And if it fits the narrative, then you got something. There have been people who have committed eisegesis. They put messages in there that really aren't in there. They see things that really aren't in there, and they squash them into, like I say, a round peg into a square hole. But what really tells you whether or not it's real is does it fit the narrative? And it does fit the narrative. Are you not living stones? And did you not get shaped by the water of the word in the brook? Are you not vessels of the living God? <laughs> Praise God. Amen. What he has left us, folks, if we're willing to look deeper and say, your word is magnificent, my God. You have given me so much more that's on the, 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 the what's on the surface. And every time... I go deeper, deeper, deeper. It just glorifies him all the more. And it strengthens faith to the point where nobody on this planet can rob you of your faith once you understand this word that he has given us. He is the living word. He is the very creator of the universe. I was listening to Adrian Rogers this morning. Adrian Rogers, he's dead now. Been dead for oh, maybe 18, 19 years now. What a preacher. What a preacher. And he was talking about uh, the foolishness of uh, accepting evolution to the exclusion of God, you know. And uh, he says, look, look up in the sky. See all those points of light up there. All of them said, what holds them together? And he read from Colossians chapter 1 that 
Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. And in him, everything is held together. And if you guys remember, I've said this for years, they, they want to know what gravity is? They're trying to figure out what gravity is. We can see its results, but what is it? It's Jesus! He holds everything together. And Adrian Rogers said that this morning. <laughs> Jesus holds the galaxies together. Jesus put the sun at the center of our solar system. Jesus. And yeah, he said, years ago, somebody, uh, some organization said, for a fee, uh, we will name a star after somebody that you want. <laughs> and he said, well, too late. They're already named. <laughs> yeah, because... He named each one of them. Yeah, yeah. Praise God. <laughs> when David confronted Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, verses 48 to 50, he had no armor and no spear. He only had a sling and five smooth stones that he took from a brook. 1 Samuel 17, verses 48 to 50 says, So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in, in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank, sank, didn't strike, sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. Notice what it was that brought the giant down. One smooth stone. A smooth stone that's smoothed by the water rushing over it in a brook. Now remember what the brook is, right? The brook is actually the word of God. The water of the word cleanses and produces maturity. The water of the word removes roughness by threshing and winnowing. Now, you know what threshing and winnowing is? Threshing is when the seed is put on a, a hard floor and then uh, something, whether it's feet or uh, um, they use a roller now, I guess, to roll over it or uh, ox uh, trample it or even people trample it and what that does it breaks the husk away this the uh, skin away from the seed uh, so that now uh, the winnower comes along the winnower with a winnowing fork and that's a fork that he uses to pick up the the seeds toss them in the air and the wind blowing across the threshing floor the, the seeds are heavier they fall straight down and the husk is lighter and it's blown outside to be burned. Mm, interesting, huh? And uh, what is it that's trampling the seeds? It's daily life. You know, it's things that, that are causing us to realize our condition so that we can call out to him for, change me, Lord, right? And then while that's happening, the wind, Jesus is there with the threshing, the, uh, the winnowing fork, tossing you and me up in the air, right? And then the wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing across the threshing floor and blowing the chaff out to be burned. See, it's, as Jim said earlier, it ain't me, it's him. He's the one that cleanses us. He's the one that changes us. Praise God. Remember, you see in John the Baptist does that. He declares in Matthew 3, verses 11 and 12, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You know, 
when John the Baptist said that I cannot take his sandal? What he's saying is, my job is finished. It's his job to toss you in the air and let the Holy Spirit separate the chaff from you. Amen? To me, the message is clear. It is only as a vessel of the Lord Jesus that we have victory over the devil and his agents, whether they're demonic or human. Because believe me, they're not just demonic, they're human also. Give us the discernment to be able to see the difference. Also, give us the mercy and the compassion to try to bring them to understanding. But also, give us the fortitude to be able to turn on our heels if they simply reject him. Amen? We have that example in the Lord Jesus Christ. He never hung around to try to persuade anybody anything. What he did was he gave them the truth. They were, they were free to accept it or reject it. If they didn't accept it, he left. So, Christian, don't agonize on leading a person to Jesus. Plant seeds, absolutely, but don't agonize on leading them to, to God. It's only living stones that can resist the devil. James 4 verse 7 says it plainly. Submit to God, then you can resist the devil and he will flee from you. You cannot fight this battle in your own strength. It has to be in his strength. Help me get out of the way, Lord, when the devil comes to try to, try to manipulate me. Let me get out of the way. Now regarding the number five, it is five smooth stones, right? Regarding number five, we've already looked at the stone and what it indicates. There are those who would teach that the five, the five stones represent the five-fold ministry working together like the fingers on a hand. Uh, and that, you know, that's probably quite true, but there might be more to it than that, I don't know. In Ephesians 4.11, it tells us that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers. Now, in short, five is recognized as a biblical, biblical number of grace. So yes, uh, fivefold ministry, yes, but grace, grace too. And grace might be the most important part of it all. Grace is the very spirit of God working in the life of a believer. We, you know, grace is also the Spirit of God working on the unbeliever to try to get him to come to a realization of what he, what he is, right? The producer of filthy rags. Uh, he's deceived himself into thinking that he can do good things, and he can't. Because, you know, I've used the example before. I think it's a good example. When I go to Australia, I can use American money because it's pretty much accepted anywhere in the world. But if I come back here with Australian money, I've got to trans transfer it into American money because I can't buy a thing with it here. Well, it's the same with good works. You know, human good, human good is not negotiable Human good is not negotiable in heaven. Human good is only of value on earth. Right? So it's important that we know that. Human good will get you something here in the world, but it gets you nowhere in heaven. It has to be his good. His good is what is negotiable in heaven. Praise God. So grace is given, this is called unmerited favor. God calls on the just and the unjust. He calls on the evil and the good. He calls on everybody. They, they, this is what the reconciliation of cross was all about. It made Jesus, it made God through Jesus available to everybody without exception. But until you reach up and take the hand that's extended to you, you don't have contact, and you don't receive what has been offered. You know, it's like you say, heard it by many pulpits, I can offer you $1,000, ain't yours till you take it. You know, 
And it's the same with salvation. It's not yours until you reach out and take it, folks. Now he, he's honest and he's reliable. He'll give it to you. But that is the first part of grace. But once, you know, that's what we call unmerited favor. But once you get born again, that's when grace really takes root. Because then, if you look at the Greek word charis, which is the translation for grace, and you look at it, you know what it's going to tell you? It's not just going to say unmerited favor. It's going to say it's the divine influence on your heart and its manifestation in your life. In other words, God says, let me share myself with you. Be a partaker of my divine nature and I will flow through you into the world. That's grace. That's grace. That God's character, God's personality, God's mercy, God's everything will flow through the, the born-again believer. So, unmerited favor, that's before you get saved. When you get saved, by golly, it better be the divine influence on your heart and its manifestation in your life. Amen? God's presence in the life of the believer, that's what imparts the strength to withstand the spiritual onslaught and carry us through to victory over otherwise impossible circumstances and conditions. Don't try to fight the spiritual battle, which is huge, in your own strength. You will fail. Get out of the way. Let him do it. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. My spirit working through the born-again believer. Now, the Red Sea, parting the Red Sea, in that we can see an impossible obstacle that is removed as the Spirit of God is projected into the adversary. Or the adversity. <laughs> adversary is what's causing the adversity. Yeah. So we look at Exodus 14, verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. I would call that the Holy Spirit, actually. All that night, all during that time of adversity, that night, during the time of adversity, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. Division, the division between the light and the dark, the good and the evil. Use your discernment and walk on, walk on the dry right through those adversities. Amen? When we focus on the Lord as our strength, he makes a way through life's obstacles. And make no, no, uh, no mistake, life is full of obstacles, folks. You know, if, if you haven't hit, up, hit an obstacle yet, just wait a bit. It's coming. Yeah. Jehoshaphat learned this when he found himself threatened by three powerful enemies, each representing those things or characteristics that are opposed to God's nature as found in Christ. And what are they? Pride, illegitimacy, and rebellion. When you look at the names of those, those enemies that were coming to uh, to make a war with Jehoshaphat, that's what those words for those people meant. One was pride, one was illegitimacy, and one was re rebellion. And those are, three th those are three things that come against a born-again believer constantly in some form or another. Now, my full message on Jehoshaphat's battle and his uh, meaning is for another day. You know, you've heard it once, you'll probably hear it again, and but every time it's going to be a little newer. Not only that, you have to hear these things over and over again, don't you? Right? I hope we never get tired of that. Right? So, the battle is the Lord's. You know that. That's what's important to understand. Jehoshaphat's battle, which was actually the Lord's, is recorded in Second Chronicles chapter 20. And it... it in it, we can see how a powerful enemy was defeated, defeated without so much as an angry word. Remember? 
They got there and the enemy was killed. In 2 Chronicles 20, verses 17 to 18, the prophet Yahaziel was filled with the Spirit of the Lord and said, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. You know, Oh, there's such a such an adversity come up against me. I don't know what I'm going to do about it. God says, the battle is mine. Run toward it. Run toward it. But not only that, he says, run toward it, praising me all the way. And that's the secret, folks. Yeah, because when you're praising him, he is in the battle and the enemy has no defense against him. So what happened? Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his, with his face to the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. They went toward there, to the battle, and when they got there, the enemy had turned on himself. I remember my mother once saying to me when I was a kid, she said, you know, if you don't get fixated, your problems will tend to work themselves out. Now, she didn't say anything about Jesus doing it, but, you know, even in the world, it's true. And, of course, God is a loving, merciful God, and so often he's behind the sacrifices that we have to make not that he causes you to sacrifice anything, but the world is a fallen world. And there are sacrifices that must occur. But he's there, ready and willing and able to pick you up if you fall. All you got to do is call out to him, right? His hand is extended. It's like, uh, I won't go into it. There's another sermon I've got about the man in the pit, you know. The people try to stop by to tell him why he's in the pit. You know, you deserve to be in that pit. But then along comes Jesus and said, take my hand, I'll pull you out of the pit. Amen. Right? What a difference, huh? Remember that it's not by might and it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts in Zechariah 4, 6. It is a divine nature that is grace manifested in the life of the believer that wins the battle. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3-4, it assures us that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Grace introduces order into chaos. Chaos is the result of rebellion. And agreement with God brings order. As Elijah found out in a cave on Mount Horeb when he read from Jezebel. He was scared stiff. Jezebel said she wouldn't kill him. So he ran to, to Horeb. This is the mountain where the law was given. And in 1 Kings 19.11, the Lord told Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. He's in the cave, and he hears the voice of the Lord. Actually, it's the word of the Lord that he's told, right? He says, Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then there was a fire, and the Lord was not in the fire. Wait a minute. If he's not in the wind, he's not in the earthquake, and he's not in the fire, where is he? After these three things went, then he heard the still, small voice of God. Right? We kind of tend to look and be impressed by Adam smashing and activity and uh, loud and aggressive. But God wasn't in 
the loud and the aggressive. He was in the peace. So he heard the still, small voice of God. God is not found in the whirlwind, whirlwind or the earthquake or the fire. His presence brings peace. And after all these, that Elijah heard the small, still small voice of Almighty God. So what is God trying to tell us? Listen to the Lord over your circumstances. Your circumstances will shout at you. But don't be distracted by the details of life. Don't let your mind wander. Martin Luther, the uh, German theologian back in the 1600s, <laughs> he had a saying, oh, I, I like it, a lot of people have heard this, you can't stop birds flying over your head. Thoughts. You can't stop birds from flying over your head. But you can certainly stop them from nesting in your hair. <laughs> right? That's cute. That's good. So Psalm 46 verse 10 says it. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Spirit, of the, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is not violent, but is powerful to the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now let's look at Mark 4, verse 39. In the Sea of Galilee, we see the Prince of Peace, with gentleness and confidence, control the violent forces of nature. It says, then he arose. He was asleep in the boat. He wasn't, he wasn't worried about the storm, but everybody else in the boat was. Then they got him up. And he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. In his three years of public ministry, Jesus showed us in both word and deed the awesome power of grace to calm the storms of life and bring the arrogance and pride to nothing. With gentleness and great finesse, Jesus toppled a mountain of tradition and changed the direction of human history. How about that? And he did it without arrogance and without violence. And as the very definition of grace, he corrected religious error and built a glorious bridge to unite man and God with his own body on the cross. Jesus showed that chaos begets chaos, but that God's grace will bring order and transform chaos into peace. So when you find the storms of life threatening to tear you apart, when you are confronted by giants that mock you and torment you, when you are discouraged by an impossible obstacle, know that relief is within, you, within your reach. God tells us in James 1, to 25, to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetter or a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So don't be a hearer of the word only. Jesus is the stone of grace that will meet life's obstacles head on and overturn them, overcome them to the glory of God. And that's what's important for us to understand. We are tremendous benefits, have tremendous benefits. We are the recipients of an amazing benefit. But the glory goes to God. Amen? Let's never forget that, folks. It's all to his glory. When David confronted Goliath, he did so with five smooth stones, but it only took one stone to bring the giant down. It was that one stone that sunk into the giant's forehead. 
That stone is Jesus as he takes up residence in the mind and the soul of a believer. When Jesus enters your place of thinking, the enemy is defeated. His head is removed. His captaincy is gone. Remember that the grace of God is his divine influence on your heart. Not just unmerited favor. His divine influence on your heart. That you become a living stone. And the living stones gather together as we are today to build a holy edifice of living stones one upon another. Amen? Amen. It is to be a part of the life of every believer. It is the character of Christ taking up residence in our lives because we are the children of God set apart for his holy purpose. We have been adopted into the family of God. You know, it's gotta, I gotta tell you this. Just, this is a recent discovery of mine. You know, these things are there waiting for us to discover them. They're just waiting. We're all familiar with the word for love in Greek is, who can tell me? Huh? No, 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 no. No, what is it? Come on. Agape, that's right. Agape is talking about divine love, right? Love that does not require a response. You even love, you agape your enemies. You don't like them, but you love them. And love means that you care about them, right? You recognize what they are, but you care about them, right? Well, the Hebrew equivalent of that, I just ran into it recently. Oh, man, it just blew me away. It's a hub. A hub. In the English, that's A-H-A-B. But in the Hebrew, it's Aleph, He, Aleph, Bet. You know what that spells? When you look at the pictograms? Love in the Hebrew, which is not just what, you know, not we've got all these different ideas of what love is, but I'm talking about love that does not require a response, love that is from God, right? That's God, behold, God, family. Ahab actually translates into behold the family of God. Isn't that astounding? And there has been for, for centuries, and I only just saw it the other day. <laughs> now we're probably going to see it all over the place. I hope. <laughs> A hub. Behold, the family of God. Whew. The house of God, the family of God, same thing. Amen. As we identify with Jesus, he is our presence in heaven and we are his presence on earth. Amen? The word of God that is believed and applied in the life is the divine influence on your heart and carries with it victory over any and all adversity. Amen?